Good morning. I'm Natalie Obico Pearson, Vancouver Bureau Chief for Bloomberg News. Joining me today is British Columbia Minister of Finance, Selena Robinson, who was appointed in November of 2020 after overseeing the housing and municipal, municipal affairs portfolios. Nothing like taking over the finance portfolio in the middle of a pandemic. Welcome, Minister, and thank you for making the time today. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. Uh, and I'd like to just uh, first of all acknowledge that I am coming to you from the territories of the Coast Salish peoples, in particular the Kwikwetlam First Nation. Uh, and uh, there is nothing like becoming finance minister uh, in the middle of a pandemic. The past two years have certainly been challenging. And here in British Columbia, of course, uh, we've been, remained focused on protecting people, their lives, their, their livelihoods. Uh, and as well as we head into recovery, building uh, you know, a, 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 a bridge a bridge to a sustainable and innovative and inclusive uh, future. I'd like to begin today uh, with your recently released first quarterly report. Uh, you did take over at a very difficult time, but that said, it does look like things are looking up compared to earlier this year when you first released the budget. Perhaps you can share some thoughts on the outlook for the province. Well, th thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, we've certainly, as a as a as a jurisdiction, uh, we started uh, and headed into this pandemic in in uh, in good um, uh, you know fiscal order uh, with a strong economy, and that really has made a difference in terms of how we have weathered uh, COVID. Uh, and you know, investing in people, investing in their livelihoods uh, has I think has paid off. But really, it's about British Columbians really doing what they needed to do, which is to follow the public health orders, making sure that they were doing everything that was asked of them. Um, the uptake for vaccinations as well has made a, a significant difference. And it's because of that, along with, you know, I think, uh, being very prudent, being very prudent in our forecasting. Uh, this has been uh, uh, an event like like no other uh, right across the globe. And so uh, being prepared, being prepared has been, uh, I think, very important. It's why we put in, we built in prudence uh, into, you know, our forecast, uh, our forecast allowance, but as well as uh, on the expense side and making sure that we had a con uh, robust contingency so that we could continue to be responsive, continue to invest in British Columbians, continue to invest in their in their in their livelihoods, making sure that they could uh, weather this storm as well. Um, having said that, uh, and and while I'm pleased with the first quarterly results, um, we're still very cautious. Uh, we have certainly seen uh, we haven't been able to fully open in the way we had uh, anticipated when we um, when we tabled our budget. Uh, uh, sorry, just after our budget, we put together a plan back in May, uh, and what we saw uh, was an anticipation to open up more fully in September uh, to our, our phase four, and that hasn't materialized. We're seeing the Delta variant having impact. Uh, we're seeing that, um, you know, that there's certainly some um, industries, particularly tourism, arts and culture that are continue to be impacted by the, the Delta variant and, and the COVID-19. And so as a result, uh, we're, we're continuing to be very prudent in our forecasting, recognizing that, that not every everything is open and not every industry is as robust as uh, we would hope they would be at this point. Just, just two things in the budget that I did want to follow up on. Um, to your point about the Delta variant, and, and I suppose any other variant that could still yet emerge, um, you know, what kind of a risk does that pose to the economic recovery? And I guess, um, what kind of a cushion have you built into your finances? Well, you'll see in, in our budget that we've built in uh, not just a a, um, a more uh, significant uh, regular contingency, but we've built in over $3 billion for COVID and recovery contingencies, recognizing that we need to have a little bit more room given the uncertainty uh, around that, as well as our, our forecast allowance is a billion dollars uh, built in as well. So we, we knew uh, and anticipated that we would have to make sure that we had enough flexibility flexibility um, to do uh, what British Columbians needed us to do. Uh, as a jurisdiction, we never really fully shut down. Um, and because we have a diverse economy, we were able to see um, lots of activity that helped to generate the revenues that, that government needs in order to deliver the services that people count on. So uh, we, we certainly saw, um, you know, forestry, um, you know, being sustained. We've had a number of capital projects that uh, um, we have been investing in since we formed government in 2017. And those are, uh, you know, kept things going in a, in a robust way, kept people working. Um, and again, once again, I have to hand it 
to British Columbians. They have done uh, an incredible job of helping to get us through, doing the right thing, following public health orders. Um, and that has made, I, I think, a really significant difference in keeping small businesses open, allowing our restaurants, I mean, uh, you know, investing in, in, in small businesses so that they could pivot to a more online presence. Um, you know, a lot of uh, folks, small businesses, switched to online uh, and, um, and British Columbians stepped up and, and continued to participate in an online economy that really helped uh, businesses get through uh, the most challenging part of this, uh, of this pandemic. It really was remarkable living here compared to, I think, many other jurisdictions, how the economy was able to stay somewhat open throughout this whole ordeal. You know, kids stayed in school all of last year, so we were, we were really quite lucky, I think. I wanted to spin forward a little bit to your funding strategies looking ahead. Are there any plans to issue more bonds, euro, USD, Canadian? Well, as uh, we have been uh, doing that that work in terms of of, of uh, recognizing that that we need to um, get that work done, um, as of Q1, the updated uh, gross borrowing requirements for 21-22 has declined uh, by about 6.3 billion uh, to 13 million. The remaining borrow requirement is about 6.3 billion. Um, and that's expected to be a combination of long term and short term financing. Um, so you know, we're in a we're in pretty good shape, all things considered. Uh, back in 2016, BC was one of the first foreign governments to issue panda bonds, and the NDP government did return to the Chinese market in 2017, saying it was important to raise capital in China in order to diversify trade and financial relationships. Of course, in the meantime, uh, Canada and China's relationship has changed considerably. BC has been on the front lines of that with the Huawei CFO extradition case. Uh, you know, some remarkable news over over the weekend as, as she returned home and the two Michaels came back to Canada. Uh, and yet, I, I think it would be safe to say that many of those tensions do still remain. Um, how does that affect the BC economy and how the province approaches diversification? Well, we have no plan at this time for another panda bond issuance. Um, and I will say um, it was... Um, um, with heartfelt relief to see the two Michaels come home and, and uh, want to welcome them back to Canada. Um, we do have a strong trade relationship uh, with China. It's based on close economic uh, and cultural ties that have been established over many decades. Um, and the province, uh, we've diverse, our, our diversification with China has, of course, grown over the years. Uh, two decades ago, it was about 2%. Uh, of BC's merchandise exports went to China in the past five years, that shares almost 15%. Um, and having said that, we're continuing to broaden our Asian um, markets. Uh, that's very uh, important to, to the province. Um, and, you know, we do have um, BC businesses, you know, um, established in China that continue to engage positively with uh, Chinese partners, clients, and investors on commercial opportunities. Um, you know, we're con committed to ensuring that we continue to benefit from our trade and investment relationship uh, with um, Asian countries. It's, it's part of what allows us to be uh, so diverse. It's not just with the U.S. that um, uh, having uh, other trading partners really uh, puts us in a, in a much better uh, financial footing uh, and, and make sure that we're continuing to, to invest in those relationships. And I think it's really important to recognize that Diversifying in the Indo-Pacific region uh, and continuing to engage with a wide range of commercial counterparts in the region is, uh, is, is of critical importance to us here in British Columbia. And of course, we're geographic, geographically positioned for that <laughs> really well. Um, one other thing that I think has really hit home in BC were, are the real-time costs of climate change this year. That heat wave that we endured here was unprecedented. Um, how much of an impact will those have on the province's finances battling the wildfires that erupted after that heat wave? Yeah, that's a, that was pretty significant this year. Uh, the last three out of five summers have seen um, the, you know, a tremendous impact of, of forest fires um, here in British Columbia. This has been the most um, expensive uh, forest uh, fire season that we've had, um, over $800 million. 
uh, to date, uh, that, or sorry, that we are expecting um, in terms of the, the actual, the real costs. Um, and we have uh, legislative authority to spend what we need to spend. Um, and having said that, uh, it is absolutely critical and it's very much a priority of our government to certainly address climate change. It is real. We're seeing it around the world that we need to be um, ad you know, addressing uh, the, the climate realities that we are all facing, um, not just for today and for economic costs, but for the future generations. Um, and I think that that, uh, I think, is really um, being recognized uh, around the world, but also, um, you know, in in in. in um, in uh, economic terms, um, this is uh, a significant challenge that we all um, are facing. And we're taking more than a dozen actions uh, this year as part of a first phase of climate adaptation and uh, climate preparedness and adaptation strategy to make sure that we have a, a you know a, a significant prevention response to make sure that um, communities aren't um, affected in the same way that they've been affected whether it's you know cleaning out our forest floors um, you know controlled burns uh, making sure that we uh, build up the resilience um, in our province so that we you know um, can better manage uh, these these sorts of risks. But also um, recognizing, you know, uh, and I'm just going to remember that, you know, that goes for flooding as well. We've had a significant flood year in 2017, I believe it was, uh, or 2018. Uh, and and again, uh, you know, th that too, we need to be, be better prepared for um, what's, um, what's happening uh, around the world with climate change. Right now, we have a, a public uh, input is on the draft of the second phase of that uh, strategy, the climate preparedness and adapt adaptation strategy to um, to hear from the public. Um, and this is about building partnerships. This is about um, making sure that we uh, can enhance community resilience to the to floods and extreme heat, as well as other you know, climate impacts. Um, we need to protect our ecosystems. Uh, we need to protect ourselves. We need to protect uh, the future for our, our children and our grandchildren. I do often like to point out to my U.S. friends and colleagues that here in B.C., we uh, I think we are the largest North American electrical vehicle market per capita, and that the electricity we use every day is 98% clean. So it's, it's, it's something to be proud of. Um, I wanted to move on to housing because it seems like we can never have a talk about BC or, or Vancouver without getting to housing at some point. Uh, prices did continue to rise throughout the pandemic, I think to many people's surprise. Uh, and that did of course exacerbate a crisis, yet at the same time provide some resilience to the economy. Um, it does seem that policies targeting demand haven't been able to make homes affordable. What more can be done with supply? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a, a conundrum of a of a of, of a uh, in this situation, given that um, you know revenues from from you know housing sales um, was certainly helpful to the bottom line, yet uh, we continue to have a, a very expensive housing market here in British Columbia. As uh, as uh, BC's previous housing minister, we put together a thirty point plan to address the housing crisis that, frankly, was ignored for many, many, many years. Um, we've instituted many of those pieces, and we were seeing moderation in the market. We were seeing some of those. Numbers come down, um, acting on all of those, pretty much all of those 30 points. Uh, but the, again, the pandemic really changed the dynamic of housing purchases uh, and the dynamic and the relationship that people have with their housing, having to work in a, in a, a work from home made uh, the desire for larger spaces for living and put pressure on um, on existing stock. And uh, the supply issue is a, is a is an important one. And making sure it's not just supply; it's about the right supply. Uh, so if you take a look at our housing starts, they're always you know been incredibly robust. But it's really are we building the right kind of housing for the people that need it? And and that's really been a target of our government is making sure that the right supply is being built. And that requires working with all orders of government. Uh, it means working with the federal government. It means working with local governments. They have a critical role here because they have the land use planning responsibilities here in British Columbia. And if they're not identifying lands for the right kind of housing, um, then it becomes really, um, you know, really challenging. So it's incumbent on all orders of government to be working together. And that's the, very much a focus of our government in um, helping to um, build the right kind of supply for the people here in British Columbia. It's likely many parts of Canada might actually be looking to BC for lessons as well since this 
problem sort of surfaced early here. Um, employment levels in BC are among the strongest in Canada, and the province fared better than uh, employment-wise than many of its uh, provincial peers during the pandemic. Uh, but it's often pointed out that wages here lag behind other urban centers in Canada and certainly seem to be out of step with the living costs, especially the housing prices that we've just been talking about. Um, how, how can the government address that quandary? Well, well, first of all, um, I just want to point out that Stats Can Labor Force Survey says that BC actually has the second highest average hourly rate among provinces at $30.44 an hour. So, so um, you know, I'm not sure that that's quite accurate. Um, having, having said that, I think, um, you know, we recognize that there's, uh, with, with um, uh, recoveries starting, we certainly started to see people going back to work. And we are seeing um, incredible em employment numbers that, again, no one was really predicting. And I think it's because we kept things bo buoyant, we kept things open, people were able to, I, I guess, move around the labor circuit uh, and find work that was perhaps more stable, um, that better met their their needs, um, given, I think, through the pandemic, people's needs changed and people saw things, I think, a little differently. And so uh, we've, we've certainly seen um, some uh, some changes in the labor force. Uh, we've been analyzing and studying the labor market to better understand you know, how this pandemic has impacted them. Um, having said that, we know that um, BC is a desirable place to live. Uh, we also know that um, you know, upskilling uh, people is incredibly important, making sure that we are um, an inclusive society is also very much a value here in British Columbia. So investing in people, investing in their skills, investing in their education has been a very, very uh, critical element of our uh, economic recovery and will continue to be an important part of our economic recovery, making sure that we have the labor force of tomorrow. Uh, we have incredible investment in the tech sector, for example, that is, I, I, I think, uh, you know, a, a real important component of continuing to diversify our, um, our economy. We have um, incredible activity happening right now in the forestry sector and rethinking about how we uh, are stewards of our forests, making sure that that industry is there for the long term. Uh, we are we have the, clean, the cleanest energy, as you pointed out before, uh, and uh, making sure that we continue to invest in, in, in that sector. As well, you know, with climate change, making sure that we are um, investing in the industries of tomorrow, investing in making sure that we have a clean, green economy that is sustainable for the long run. And that uh, there's tremendous activity happening on that front here in British Columbia uh, and is a good place to invest as a result uh, and uh, and I you know want to invite people to uh, come and check us out. Just on that last point, uh, the, I think sometimes it's overlooked to what degree uh, BC's economy is shifting away from this sort of traditionally natural resources, goods-based export economy uh, to a service-based economy. Uh, that said, some of the highest paying jobs traditionally were in the resource sector. As we see this shift to a service-based economy, what does that mean for wages in the region? Uh, at, the, you know, the cost, the, 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 that, that sort of going back to that quandary, we're talking about the cost of living here versus what, what jobs will pay. So I, I think we need to remember that, um, you know, it's more than just a service-based economy, right? We have a, a, you know, a tech sector that is growing uh, in, in significant leaps and bounds, certainly South Island uh, and around the Victoria area, around Vancouver. Um, we have a $100 million BC tech fund which as a venture capital fund of funds. Uh, it, it invests in emergency tech, uh, emerging technology companies in the province. Uh, we've launched uh, NBC, which is a new uh, independent $500 million um, strategic investment fund, also to help promising uh, companies grow while generating returns that benefit all British Columbians. Uh, we've made investments in agritech. So there's a real, um, you know, real opportunity here that's just starting to burgeon. Um, I was actually just at a, at a farm last week uh, out in Chilliwack, and they have a robot that milks all their cows. And we were talking about, so they don't, they don't 
they don't rely on agricultural workers the way they they historically have. It's obviously quite fascinating. But also in my conversation with the the farmer, um, and we were talking about the transition to technology, and he was pointing to his son who can monitor the cows getting the cows getting milked on his watch. He can sort of see what's happening. So we know, uh, and we are investing in that sort of you know, forward thinking, um, anticipation of how it is that we are using technology to, to, to generate food, for example, here in British Columbia. And those sorts of, of opportunities are, are incredible here. And that's part of, you know, our thinking in terms of diversifying, in terms of making sure that we um, have a robust economy, that we have, um, you know, it's a good place to live, it's a good place to work, it's a good place to invest, so that people have, you know, good paying jobs that don't just serve us here uh, in British Columbia, but that can be exported uh, right around the world.